And we are live. Hello, everybody. Happy Thursday. We are back with another episode of the Antler Queens, a Yellow Jackets podcast. And I'm Media Melanie, along with... I'm Kelly Geist. Hello. Hello. And uh, today we are going to cover Yellow Jackets Season 1, Episode 8, Flight of the Bumblebee, which is an extremely action-packed episode. Lots of stuff to unpack here. Um, before we dive into the episode, though, just, you know, we wanted to give our little buzzworthy Yellow Jackets news of the week. And that is that Melanie Linsky, our girl, is on a new uh, five-night event on Hulu called Candy. Um, it's her, Jessica Beal, and actually Justin Timberlake is also in it. It's based on a true story of a woman who um, axe murders her friend. And um, I actually caught part of episode one. I haven't finished it yet. Cannot wait. And, um, you know, it's just so nice to see Melanie Linsky in something else. And, you know, I mean, Christina Ricci's also got the new Wednesday Adams thing coming up. And uh, she's in that monstrous movie. So it's so great to see see all of our Yellow Jackets cast members keeping busy so we can watch them on other things before uh, season two gets here. So, yeah. Yeah. Candy on Hulu, and uh, you know it's right in our realm of, of things that we love. It's more '80s than '90s, but it's it's cool, like the wardrobe and and all that stuff. Jessica Biel's character is just so um, interesting. So, yes. yeah, cool. Yes. Yeah, I still have to uh, I still have to catch up with it. I haven't gotten a chance yet, but you know, so busy these days. Oh my goodness, it's a good thing Yellow Jacket season two doesn't come out for a bit because boy, you know, we've uh, still got some. Got some of season one and other things to cover. And um, yeah, yeah, we're, we're excited about it. Um, so why don't we dive into season one, episode eight, Flight of the Bumblebee. Kelly, tell us about the writers, director, all the good stuff. All right. Well, this episode was directed by Ariel Kleiman. Uh, writers were Ashley Lyle, Bart Nickerson, and Cameron Brent Johnson, who I think is actually one of the one of the only male names that we've had, um, not the definitely not the only one. Right. Um, I mean, aside from Bart Nickerson, he's definitely not the only one, but um, he's one of them. It's a very female heavy show. Yep. Yep. And that's cool. And, you know, I love that Ashley and Bart are actually married. I, I think yeah. that, that, you know, gives such a cool dynamic for the writing and, you know, they're so in tune with one another. So it's, it's cool. And and now, yeah, we've got Cameron Brent Johnson here. And um, how about the episode summary? What is madness and what is divine? While in triage after a vicious attack, the Yellow Jackets are left to suss out the best of their worst ideas. Shauna dabbles in some light cyber stalking. And um, I just have to apologize. I'm a little flushed today. I'm like, my allergies are kicking in now. And I'm just, Aww. I'm kind of a mess. So you're fine. Well, hey, like you, I just- you look great. Oh, well, thank you. You look so great. You. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank but, you. Yeah. I, I look like I need some Benadryl in like an ice bath. Oh, hey, you're you're doing just fine. Your headband is really on point, too. I love our headband game, by the way. We have some yeah, great headbands yeah, in general. So good, good, good for us. We're very cute. Um, so the episode opens in the past timeline. And, you know, last week it picks up where they left off. We saw Van, who was being what looked like torn apart by wolves. And um, we open with the girls actually trying to set her on fire. And this is not the first time Van has had a rub with fire on mm-hmm. Yellow Jackets, of course. You know, in, in the pilot, or actually, I guess the second episode, um, she was, you know, on fire in the plane. And Jackie and Shauna, or actually more specifically Jackie, you know, was more concerned with getting Shauna out of there. And they, you know, didn't help Van get out. So second brush with fire for Van. Um, but a few minutes after, you know, their their fire starts, or moments, I should say, um, Van actually opens her eyes and starts to move. And, you know, they quickly, like, start putting the fire out. Like, first of all, I was like, you know, did they not check her pulse, right? I mean, yeah. I her, you know, face was torn apart, so maybe it was a very faint pulse. I don't know. Like, all I'm saying is 
maybe would have checked her pulse before setting her on fire. But hey, you know, <laughs> I mean, really, really crazy moment, obviously. And then Van says, really? Fire? And, like, <laughs> how does she muster up the strength to deliver so one of her incredible Van one-liners, you know? Um, and, you know, speaking of Van, actually, an article came out yesterday where Melanie Linsky was talking about them casting Van in the present timeline. Um, yeah. And she was talking about, like, Natasha Leone, their good friend. She's on Russian Doll, um, among other things. Um, but I guess she's too busy. So I'm sticking with my want of Julia Stiles. Uh, yeah, for, me too. Van. But there are some other great contenders out there. So it's it's good to know that they've confirmed that Van will actually be coming into the present timeline. Um, yeah, you know, I really want to see. Um, I'm I'm really hoping for for an adult Mari too, because the more I think about it, like she's not, you know, she's she's not a character that I'm like in love with or anything. I mean, she's a smaller character, but just the way that she's like she buys into the whole supernatural thing so much, and she's so like. She's very up Jackie's ass, you know. She's very like, she's very tribal that way. Mm -hmm. You know, she is. If if there's an adult, an adult Mari, you know that she's gonna be like Lottie's crazy right hand woman. Oh my god, a hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, I kind of had Mari pegged for Pit Girl. You know, I yeah. don't, don't know. Like, I feel like she'd be a good contender because she's not a main character. She'd be easy to take out. But it's also a great red herring, you know, where they maybe make it seem like it could be her. And then turns out, hey, she is alive and, you know, at Lottie's side in the present timeline. So it'll yeah. be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, she's she's going to be if, she, if there's an adult Mari out there, she is freaking crazy. <laughs> yes. Oh, my goodness. Know. Oh my goodness. Um, and so the next scene is actually a flashback. So we're still in the past, but it's the way past. Well, maybe not way past, but uh, years earlier, we see Laura Lee, um, who's at the Mary Magdalene summer camp. And um, for some reason, she decides to dive um, head first into the pool. And, you know, it was a, it was a really hard scene to watch because her head, you know, hits the bottom of the pool and we see the blood and she's floating there. And I'm like, oh my God, I mean, we obviously know she's still alive because it's a flashback, but I'm like, how did she not come out of this with brain damage or something? It was. Yeah, I know. It was yeah, I, I couldn't. Bloody. Yeah, I had a hard time watching that scene. That was that was rough. Oh, my goodness. So the lifeguard starts giving her CPR. You know, everybody's kind of like gathered around her. He's got a cross around his neck and, you know, the lifeguard performs CPR. She wakes up, opens her eyes and she says, you saved me and is really, really focused on this cross you know around his neck and he says i didn't save you laura lee he did and looks up at the sky so you know it's interesting you know is this the first moment when laura lee is like super sold in the religion or was you know it's probably her upbringing she's at the summer camp right so um which seems to me to be a church camp but um you know this maybe just like nails down her the faith piece for her um, but it, it was a hard scene to watch, like the bloody head hitting the cement. That was that was tough. Yeah. And, you know, what's crazy is you can see she's sitting there beforehand and you can see in big letters and big block letters, shallow end right where she was. Oh, wait, maybe it's not right oh. where she was sitting, but it's it's close enough. Yes. Um, and uh, like, oh. What were you thinking, Laura Lee? <laughs> like, seriously, I mean, that's one of the first things, you know, you're taught in swimming lessons is don't dive in the shallow end. But, yeah. you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? <laughs> so um, still in the past, um, we see Laura Lee. This is back to 1996, uh, sitting outside the cabin and asking for a sign. Um, all of a sudden, a bird comes along for this quick moment and then it flies away. Lottie uh, then joins her and asks, you know, if they're OK. And Laura Lee says, you know, they're in God. God's hands now. So, um, you know, we're definitely setting up for some Laura Lee action. She's figured very prominently in the start of this episode, getting a little backstory. So, you know, there's some action to come. And then we move to the present. And we've got a, uh, a potential new recruit for the citizen detective squad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Shauna is at home and hanging out in the kitchen in her bathrobe and Callie comes in and, uh, Looking, looking a little peeved, mm -hmm. and uh, she throws Adam's money clip on the on the counter. Um, so she said she found it on the floor by the couch, uh, <laughs> and she does not want an explanation as to how that ended up on the floor. <laughs> but um, yeah, she's like she did some digging and tried to find him online, which 
I mean, this whole thing was a little unbelievable for me because his name's Adam Martin. I mean, super common name. Yeah. So super I, common name. Unless she has like some serious citizen detective skills, her not finding anything on him is not really a big red flag, I don't think. Right, right. And, you know, she says, I'm not saying that everything is on the internet, uh, except, or I'm saying that everything is on the internet, except for your boyfriend. So, yeah. yeah. So she thinks that, you know, she's warning Shauna. She thinks that he might be trying to con her. Um, but uh, she's, you know, Shauna's just telling her, like, look, I know this is shitty, but, you know, your dad, inventory database, hello. <laughs> and right? like, you wanted me to do something about it. And now I kind of sort of did. And now you're mad at me either way. And right, Kelly right. just kind of like storms off. And so she's late for, for her homeroom. But at the heart of it, like, she's actually caring about her mom. You know, she shows that she does care. And maybe yeah. some of this, like, you know, past snark is, you know, typical teenage stuff. But it's nice to see that yeah. she actually is, she's she's trying to kind of look out for her, I guess. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, and she obviously had an effect because Shauna, a.k.a. Sandra Norberg. Uh, <laughs> I have to add that screenshot. <laughs> oh, my God. I sat, I sat there in front of my computer for like five minutes trying to find the perfect screenshot, like just pausing it every second. And you I got, nailed it. Nailed if it. you're listening to this, not watching it, that's really a shame because it's a great screenshot of, of Shauna, like coming up with a name with the name Sandra Norberg and just like with this look of just like, <laughs> Yeah, yep. I mean, this is her second, you know, thing faking an identity, right? She was with the Secret Service when she was yes. at the hotel, you know, undercover, and now she's undercover. You know, she really is a good citizen detective. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yes. Coming up the ranks, coming up the ranks. <laughs> Definitely. And uh she's calling Pratt and saying she's Sandra Norberg from another school and she's trying to get his his transcripts, but there is no record of him attending. Hmm. Um and uh, so, you know, I'm sure she's not too happy with that. No, no, probably not happy at all. And you're right. She was a terrible liar in that scene. Like, just Horrible. not, <laughs> not, not very believable. But hey, she got the information she needed. Yeah. And then, um, then Jeff comes home in, a, in an unusually good mood. Hmm. Um, and he's like humming a little tune. And he comes in and he like gives her a bag from Sex Fifth Avenue. And... Uh, it's this yellow dress and her response is so funny. She's like, if this is your idea of an anniversary gift, you're about three months and my entire personality off. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, the dress was not great. Like it was yellow and very tight. And even though, you know, we love yellow and yellow jackets, it was not the right dress for Shauna. Jeff missed the mark a little bit there. Yeah. But the, it's the thought that counts. Yeah. And, you know, he said, uh, well, you know, tomorrow's, your reunion and you married homecoming royalty. So apparently, you know, apparently it's a big deal that he was homecoming queen and, or he was homecoming king. And, uh, you know, so she has to wear the, she has to wear the yellow jackets colors. Oh my God. Unbelievable. <laughs> homecoming royalty. That might've been when Jeff actually peaked. Yes. Yes. I'm, you know, I'm one of those be... peaking in high school type people, but anyway, um, yeah. but yes. he was really sweet. He like, you know, he, he brought her a dress. Then he's like, you know what, whatever. Like you're you're gonna be turning heads no matter what, and Aww. he gets your kiss. He was really sweet. He was. He has his moments of being, you know, a, a nice, caring husband. So yeah. it was nice. I, you know, I didn't love the dress. So I'm, I'm yeah. with Shauna. But um, then we move back to the past again. Uh, Travis is playing solitaire. Nat comes in and asks if he wants to go hunting, but it's apparent that he's kind of avoiding her. Um, Nat says, there are no queens in that deck, you know, want to go for a walk, bring the rifle, try to hunt, who knows, maybe we'll get lucky. And Travis says, you go, you're better at it anyways. And, you know, we're starting to see Travis kind of getting this like little, you know, attitude with her and, you know, things might be unraveling a little bit for, um, Tradley. Yeah. And, you know, I'm just, I'm so hung up on that line because it seems like a type of, you know, some type of foreshadowing. The uh, mm. about there being no queens in that deck, but I can't figure out what it could be. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. For. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. 
Um, that's something I've been thinking about for a long time and I haven't come up, come up with an answer yet. <laughs> TBD. Um, but uh, so Natalie um, in the present, Natalie is in her motel room getting drunk and playing around with some, some, uh, some crazy eyeliner. And uh, she's, she's clearly upset about Kevin. Um, she's like sniffing his pillow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and i i had i have to mention that uh my favorite song from the episode plays in this scene um fade into you by Mazzy star yes and that was probably the most prominently figured song yeah. into into the episode as well so i would have to agree that that is my favorite tune for this episode as well i love that song that song is i've always said that's going to be the first if i if i ever become famous and they do a movie about my life that's my first pick for the soundtrack because it happened. I heard that song, not for the first time, but I remember hearing that song during a really super pivotal moment in my life. Hmm. And it stuck with me forever. It was when um, I was, my dad and I were getting in his van and driving off to my freshman year of college. And like my mom and, um, and boyfriend and best friend were like standing there and I turned on the radio and, and fade into you was playing. And it was like, it was just such a, it was just such a cinematic moment. <laughs> oh, gosh, total song for the soundtrack of your life, Kelly. Yes. I love that story. That's fantastic. Absolutely. Love that. But uh, yeah. So Natalie is uh Natalie sends somebody a quick text message. Um, she says, I'm Victor's friend. And the person writes back and says, yeah, I got you. And she says room 135. So that, that looks like it could be a, a little, you know, not too great. It could be up to something not too great, but yep. we'll see. Yeah, yeah. I have my suspicions at that point. Um, and yes, they will be confirmed later. Yes. Um, we then go back to the past. Um, we find Nat uh, sitting with uh, Coach Ben by the stream, and they are having a conversation. Um, you know, Coach Ben tells her that he's gay. He has a boyfriend named Paul. And then they kind of start talking about Travis a little. Natalie's, you know, trying to get a little bit of uh, advice out of him. And Ben says, um, you guys do know that we were never. And Nat says, well, I'm pretty sure she's not your type. Um, oh, actually, I guess I should back up a little bit. Um, uh, sorry, lost my train of thought there. Um, anyway, I preemptively said that Paul was gay, but the dialogue reveals it. And uh, Nat says, you like guys, right? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. No, I know. It's just you never look at our boobs. And she says, no, I think it's cool. You have a boyfriend. So um, sorry, I jumped ahead a little bit there. But um, it was kind of a funny line when she's like, you know, you never look at our boobs. I thought that was funny and very, uh, very good observation on her part. Yeah. And, um, you know, Ben then says, you know, my boyfriend's Paul. He's a writer. He actually wanted me to move into the city with him. And um, Nat said, if you lost him, you're afraid you'd have nothing left. You don't think that, that, you know, Travis is gay. So she's basically trying to feel out now that she confirms that Coach Ben is gay. Like, is Travis gay? Is this leading to his problems of him, you know, not being able to get it up? Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, Ben says, right, right. Well, just so you know, that's not exactly unheard of. And, um, you know, Ben kind of tries to make her feel better, says he's probably just nervous. And, you know, trust me, Nat, I've seen the way the kid looks at you. He's in pretty deep. So, um, you know, it was a nice little exchange between the two of them, an unlikely exchange, I, I feel like. And it was the first time, you know, that Coach Ben has really opened up about his personal life. And it was yeah. really nice of Nat to be the one there um, listening. And I, I have some thoughts on this in the spoiler section. I'm going to make a note for that right now in case I forget. <laughs> oh, yes, 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 yes. Make that note. Yeah. Um, and then in the meantime, Ty's group is trying to get Van back to the cabin. Um, she's obviously in really bad shape and Ty can't even keep her upright. Uh, Van wants them to leave her there to die because it's not safe for them. And I mean, honestly, she's like on the brink of death anyway. Like, and the fact that she's trying to, you know, do the best for the team and everything, um, you know, is, is, really kind of heroic of her but um you know they don't leave her the others end up going back to the cabin to get help and then ty ends up staying with van um and then we move back to the present again yeah you know i um i didn't know what to think about this because like i was so happy that she survived but i was like now i'm now i'm thrilled um because she you know she's 
she was doing a little better towards the end of the episode, but um, I mean, I was convinced during the scene, there's no way she's going to make it. There's absolutely no way. Like you could hear the blood gurgling in her mouth and she's trying to talk. And I'm like, she's not going to make it. There's no fucking way, but yeah. So I was like, I was a little iffy on this. Um, but yeah, what, what a rough, <laughs> what a rough situation, man. Yeah. Yeah. Tough um, times, tough times. But uh, yeah, so our suspicions were confirmed because um, Misty is still watching uh, watching Natalie via the hidden camera. <laughs> and sure enough, she sees a guy go into her motel room and she buys some drugs off of him. And uh, she immediately just freaks out and just takes off. Um, we, she just takes off running. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> uh crazy um and then we go uh back to the past again um we see jackie and travis at the lake travis is checking the fishing nets to see if they caught anything and travis says he thinks he really fucked things up with natalie uh jackie mentions natalie had hooked up with someone named bobby and travis demands to know which bobby jackie says farley and then he storms off so obviously there's some kind of like Thing, you know with with travis and this bobby farley also like you know jackie come on like why do yeah. you got to be like stirring the pot right come on well let, we, it, let it go we learned about bobby farley earlier um when uh when he was digging up when he was trying to dig up the ring when he was trying to get the ring off of his dad's hand and he told the story of uh Bobby Farley was the one who nicknamed him Flex. Oh, that's right. That's right. I didn't realize it was that same Bobby Farley. Thank you for remembering that. Yeah. Yes. Oh, my God. And, so uh, that guy's like a total dick. And like yeah. dick, dick, I mean, in many senses of the word here, since that like whole nickname had to do with like him sucking his own dick. So, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> yes. It, and Bobby was clearly jealous because he wanted to be able to do it himself. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so obviously... Hearing Bobby Farley was hooking up with Natalie isn't going to go over well. With it was him. definitely a trigger for him. Definitely yeah. a trigger. And um, uh, then we're back in the present again. And yeah, this this scene is is fantastic. Um, so Natalie is about to break into the coke that she just bought, and she's like, she's she's lining it up, and she's about to snort it when Misty just busts in like Kool Aid Man. And <laughs> in a split second, oh my God. is like just snorts all of her coke and then just scatters the rest. You know, she just dusts it off the plate and scatters it everywhere. Yeah, that was uh, that was a little intense. That was a bold move by Misty. I was not expecting that. I know. I like, what the hell? I thought I was imagining it at first. I'm like, did this really happen? Oh my God. Oh my God. Misty, you are a real MFQ. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And then we, and then, you know, this, it's interesting because it kind of goes back and forth between the past and the present with Natalie, which is, gives you a lot, it, you know, it, it gives you a lot to think about. I'm still trying to sort that out um, in my head as to why they did that here. But, uh, you know, clearly they wanted to show her again with Travis here um, in between, which is a little, which is kind of an interesting choice. That is interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, he, he confronts her. Um, and, uh, and about Bobby Farley and she just admits it. And she, um, he's just, total, he's a total dick to her, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's um, totally not cool. Yeah. And, uh, he's, she's like, I made a mistake. And he's like, clearly I did too. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That was uh that was a tough conversation between those yeah. two. Um, but then we, you know, then we flip really quick back to the present and Misty's checking her heart rate, which has apparently dramatically increased. And um, she is, uh, she says, I couldn't sit there and watch you destroy your life. And um, well, first of all, Natalie tells her she's possessed at some point before that, which I thought was really funny. Um, but uh, she said, I couldn't just sit there and watch you destroy your life. And then Natalie's like, watch me? And then she looks at the, aromatherap the aromatherapy <laughs> diffuser. And 
she sees the little the, the lens and she grabs it and just smashes it. <laughs> she starts chucking pieces at, at Misty. Oh my god. Oh my and, god. Uh, she's like, you just wasted three hundred dollars worth of blow. <laughs> and she's like, A, I will Venmo you. I loved that line. I, I loved that line. And B, I couldn't just sit there and watch you destroy your life. So that's when it happens. But um, but yeah, Natalie is just like chucking stuff at her left and right. And uh, <laughs> and Misty's like, you know, I'm pretty much the best friend you have right now. And that's not much of a competition, is it? Like, Ouch. <laughs> Ouch is right. Burn. Um, and then she, uh, she's like, you know, you should thank me. I've been working super hard on solving Travis's case and and you don't know the lengths that I've gone to obviously referring to, you know, kidnapping Jessica and holding her hostage. (laughs) But, uh, she's like, did you know that Travis's bank account was closed immediately after he died? Um, and you know, Natalie is just not really sure. She seems like she's a little interested, but she's not really sure that she has any reason to believe her at this point. Mm Mm-hmm. But uh, then we, um, so we flip over to the Sadecki house and they're eating dinner and the doorbell rings and Shauna, Jeff gets up to get it. And Shauna and Kelly exchange this look like, uh, who is it? This, this isn't going to be, uh, <laughs> this isn't going to be Mr. Uh, Mr. Artist, is it? But uh, it's not, fortunately, it's fortunately for, Ta- for uh, Shauna, it's Taisa. Um, and Jeff invites her in. Um, and Shauna says it's a nice surprise after 20 years. Um, so she, she like clearly hasn't told Jeff that she's, you know, still in touch with her or anything. No, no, yeah, it's not keeping and more she, secrets. Yeah, yeah, she's like she's really secretive about her continued relationships with the Yellow Jackets, which is mm-hmm. pretty interesting. Yeah, um, little mysterious. Yeah, but uh, I, I really liked the scene. They they take a walk. And um, I don't know why, but this, like, this seems like it was a real street and everything. But for some reason, it just looked like a set to me. And I can't put my finger on why that is. It's something about the lighting. Um, but uh, they're taking a walk. And um, Ty- poor Thaisa, I just feel so bad for her. Like, she's terrified. And... Um, you know, she says that she's sleepwalking again and she's afraid to go to sleep. Um, and, you know, she's afraid that she's fucking her son up. And um, she let she she's pretty sure she's the one that let Biscuit out. And um, and this is really interesting. She says, uh, I spent the night pounding espressos just so I could stay in control. I don't know how bad it's going to get this time, but you know how bad it can get. And Shauna agrees. So. Yes, and I am dying to know the other incidents of her sleepwalking and what happened, right? I mean, we saw her obviously in the past, you know, waking up to the dirt in her teeth when, you know, someone went looking for her in the middle of the night. And um, now we've seen her sitting in the tree. You know, Sammy's seen her in that sleepwalking mode. And, you know, what happened to Biscuit? I mean, why did she get that bite on her hand? There's so many questions about sleepwalking. I want to know more about her past sleepwalking excursions. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it, it seems to, from what she said, it seems to have started like while they were in the woods, but, um, it's, you know, that incident with her falling asleep, um, and Van getting attacked can't be the only thing. And there's gotta be more to it than that. You know, that's right. I mean, she dropped the ball. That's true. You know, that I, I wasn't even considering that, that she completely, you know, allowed for Van to get attacked. She was on first watch that night and, and she totally blew it. And she ended up, she was up in the tree, right? I mean, she ended up up in the tree with, yeah. So anyway, that was, that was a little dicey. Um, And yeah. then we move back to the past again. Um, we see Misty, Akila, and Mari make it back to camp. And they tell the others that, you know, Tynessa are still out there. They need help. And they search the woods for them and notice a flare gun goes off. And then they were able to find them um, both passed out in the woods. They're able to get Van back to camp. And Akila stitches up her face as the others hold her down. And I just want to say, like, how did she become such a great surgeon i mean you know like what like i i can't get over the fact that they stitch her up like that and i mean it was hard to watch you know another one of those type of scenes but like wow you know and it's just uh 
it's it's tough. They're basically doing like, you know, surgery on her face. Oh, right. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And then, you know, the others are just kind of like standing there watching, like, oh my God, like horrified. I mean, as I, I don't even know if I could actually stand and watch it. Like I have trouble with some medical shows and watching some of those things. So anyway, um that yeah, was she did say that um she did say that she was in Girl Scouts. So Oh, that's right. But like, okay, Girl Scouts, like you yeah. can sew a badge on like a sash or something, but like that is next level sewing a face, like a yeah. face. Well, you know, I don't know, maybe like it's the nineties. I mean, maybe Buffalo Bill was like their one of their uh their Girl Scout. <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> oh my God, that's so funny. Yeah, she probably that's my theory. That's my new theory. Akila learned how to sew up a face from Buffalo Bill. They're good I like friends. that. I like They're that. Okay. Teams. All right. <laughs> good stuff. And uh, then we're back to the present again. 19, uh, 2019. Yes. Um, and uh, so Shauna and Taisa are, are back at the house. Um, and, you know, Taisa's spending the night. Shauna invited her to spend the night and said she'll stay with her all night. And they're having a great talk. Um, and this is fantastic. Um, Shauna asks her, like, you know, do you ever think about what our lives would have been like if it didn't happen? Um, and uh, I apologize. This is this is a little lengthy, but I had to include it because it's so great. Um, and I do, I we do have a graphic because my most likely to is included is is from this scene, and I actually just dropped it in. We couldn't find it earlier, but oh, I just dropped it in. Perfect. Now. Here we go. <laughs> okay. But uh, so Shauna says, "Do you ever think about what our lives would have been like if it didn't happen?" And she says, "I would have gone to Brown. Um, I was going to write amazing papers on Dorothy Parker and Virginia Woolf." And I uh, thought I would meet a floppy haired, <laughs> floppy haired, sad eyed poet boy who ran the lit school lit magazine. And he was going to be so smart and a little bit intimidated by me. We were going to be like full rivals until we weren't. Uh, but then my short stories would make him fall in love with me anyway. But then at some point I would have to leave him broken hearted because I was going to take my semester abroad. And that's where I met. That's when I met Francois in France. <laughs> There Ty, he is. And Ty says, oh, please tell me Francois was some sort of brooding mu musician. And she says, no, Francois was a mime. <laughs> <laughs> Miming is a serious art form in France. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so oh Francois God. is my my most likely to, um, because uh, in, in the previous episode, when Adam was hiding in the closet and, and she got him out, he made the comment like, Hey, I've never been in a French farce before. And so, you know, that could have been Francois. Um, that was a really good, most likely to Kelly, maybe your best <laughs> one yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, poor Francois. Um, but uh, Ty says, well, I was going to go to Howard pre-law with a double major in history and philosophy and date a bunch of beautiful women, make first string on the soccer team, graduate first in my class, and then I was going to go to Columbia Law and land an internship in one of the biggest firms in the city. And while she's saying this now, she has this confused look on her face. She's like, Ty, you did do all of those things, which is crazy. Like, yeah, I, like, <laughs> doing all that stuff after such a trauma, like Shauna's like, hey, you are a rock star. You did that Holy stuff. Shit. You know, I mean, like, that's more stuff than I've done. I mean, not ever, but then most people have done. <laughs> I mean, like pretty big agenda and accomplishments, Ty. But, uh, but yeah, Ty has an interesting, an interesting comment to that. She says, yeah, but if I'm being honest, not a single one of those things felt real, which is, yeah, it's kind of like, you know, she's, it's like she's sleepwalking through life. Yeah. Just going through the motions and, uh, yeah, that's, it's kind of crazy. Um, and this, you know, I was going to, um, I actually, for this week, almost did two most likelies because I had one from this next scene for Natalie. And um, I was so, I was totally going to do it. I loved it. And then Francois, the Francois thing popped up in, in my head and I'm like, I got to do Francois. And I was going to do one for Natalie anyway, but then I ran out of time. 
but Natalie was going to be my most likely to to star in a remake of Mommy Dearest. Mm, <laughs> good because, one. Uh, she's at she's in her room and she's applying like some type of it looks like a cold cream mask. Like for those of you who haven't seen Mommy Dearest, um, there's this great scene where. Uh, where she's like, she's basically got, she's got a cold cream mask on. She's got cold cream all over her face and she's just screaming at her daughter and flipping out. And, um, and so Natalie has like this, this cold cream mask in her face and she's calling the bank um, where Travis banked and she's trying to get information and, and uh, they're not helping her. And she just has a meltdown and just starts screaming and, and throws the phone and starts like trashing. She throws the television, I think. And um, she uh, she's just like screaming, can I speak to your manager? Do you believe in love? I mean, she's just having like just a full on screaming uh, tantrum. <laughs> I feel so bad for her. Yeah. I mean, and this just really speaks to, you know, the hold that Travis has always had on her and their connection. Because we're seeing, you know, the parallels in both timelines. Like they're having this struggle you know while they're out in the woods and now you know she's still struggling with travis's death here in the present so it just shows how you know deep 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 their connection and and past is so i feel really yeah. bad i feel really bad for adult natalie in this scene yeah yeah i mean it's she is just like her emotions are just getting the best of her and you know she's just she just doesn't know what to do with herself oh poor nat <laughs> i know um, but, uh, she's, as she's kind of destroying the room, she ends up on the floor and finds a little bit of Coke left. <laughs> so unfortunately, you know, of course she's going to snort it. But <laughs> I mean, she's not going to let it go to waste. She spent $300 on it. Exactly. So, you know, um, the yeah, desperation I, there though, like, oh my God. I know. Ugh. She just needed something to like numb the pain. Addiction is very real and, you know, this is trauma, you know, can feed into that and it's, yeah, it's tough. Yeah, definitely. And uh, so then we go back to Misty's house and Jessica is holding poor Caligula and threatening to break his neck. Eee! Yeah, Jessica gets my my shithead of the week. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it clearly upset Misty. Like, she was very, very upset at, you know, anybody threatening Caligula. And just, like, the look on her face was just yeah. pure, pure anger and hatred. Yeah, well, she says she's going to, you know, she's going to snap his neck if, if Misty doesn't let her go. And she actually, like, she, does, she seems like she doesn't want to do it. But, um... Misty's like, she's like, fine, I'll just get another one. And so Misty, so Jessica's like, okay. So you see her like start to like kind of grab the bird tighter. And that's when, you know, Misty just then loses it and just starts throwing shit at her and screaming. And, um, and then Caligula flies away and, and she's like, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean a word of it. My poor little boy. <laughs> I mean, uh, that MFQ strikes again. <laughs> oh my god oh my god but then like the weirdest thing happened she just like after caligula flies away god, my allergies are just freaking awful today um after caligula escapes um misty's like it's just been one of those days and um she's like are you hungry i'm kind of hungry i'm gonna go make us some dinner <laughs> <laughs> like nothing ever happened like casual like oh hey let's eat you know whatever yeah, she just snorted a shit ton of blow, and her this woman almost killed her bird, and she's just like, hey, I'm kind of hungry. You want to eat something? <laughs> I mean, after snorting all that coke, you would think that, you know, she wouldn't really have an appetite either, so, you know, there's, yeah. there's a lot of things going on there. Yeah. Um, but you know yeah. what? Nice try from Jessica. I mean, hey, she tried. She knows how much Calig Caligula means to Misty. And um, unfortunately, her plan didn't work. So, you know, we move back to the past again. 
And um, we see Shauna and Ty. They're having another heart-to-heart upstairs in the attic of the cabin. And Ty's telling her about waking up in the tree and that she's scared to go to sleep. So this has a, you know, really strong parallel to the present day timeline. And Shauna says that she'll make sure she doesn't go anywhere and holds her close and tries to prevent her from getting up. And, you know, this is like Shauna's my MVP for this episode just for, you know, being there for Ty um, in in both timelines, you know, back then helping her with the sleepwalking. And then, you know, we see that same conversation in the present timeline. So for me, Shauna is MVP for for really just, you know, trying to help her friend and, and mm-hmm. being there for her. And I think that's the most important thing she could do for her at this point with all the stuff that's going on. So, yeah. Um, yeah. It was a really um it, it was a really nice parallel too between the past and the present because then you know it's basically just the present you know same thing they're lying in bed together and and uh talking about everything that's on their minds and and by the way i didn't mention it but my mvp for this episode was van for surviving <laughs> oh you know what that's a good one too i mean gosh you know i would have to agree and and uh, you know agree that maybe i have two mvps because like not only for surviving, but for surviving and delivering another quintessential yes. van one-liner while she's literally on her deathbed and was just set on fire. So right? wow, like <laughs> Energizer Bunny and, you know, and she's alive in the present, which again, cannot wait to see who they cast. I know. I'm so, so excited. As um, soon as they release this news for who are they're casting for adults, like we're going to have to do an Instagram live or a special breaking news episode or, or something just to celebrate the excitement of the uh, casting. I, I cannot wait. Yes. I mean, by the, by the way, like I've been really not to get, you know, too off on a tangent here, but I keep thinking like if Akila is still alive, she's a little bit older, but you know, I mean, there are 25 and 28 year olds playing teenagers. Um, Adina Porter looks so much like Akila. Oh, she would be a great Akila. Yeah, it, you great. know, like I said, she's a little older, but you know, she doesn't she doesn't necessarily look like she's no a lot older, and um, she just like she just she looks a lot like her. Oh, um, she'd be so she, good. Yeah, I love Adina Porter. Same. Um, <laughs> but uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm getting off on a, a whole other subject here. But uh, Shauna tells Taisa that um, that she's been having an affair. And Taisa is like, seems really amused by this. And um, she's like, sorry, I don't know why I told you that. And, and Taisa's like, no, don't be sorry. She's like, <laughs> with who? And then <laughs> one of my favorite lines. She's like, wait, shit. I swear to God, if you say it's Randy Walsh, I'm going to burn this whole fucking town. <laughs> oh, my God. Randy Walsh. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Props to Shauna for not having an affair with Randy Walsh. Yes. Thank you, Shauna. Thank you for not doing that. Um, but, uh, yeah, she says, no, it's just uh, it's just this guy. He's younger. Um, and uh, he's, she said he's really earnest in a way that kind of makes you want to punch him in the face. <laughs> <laughs> which I know what she means. Um, I think, I feel like people would describe, would describe me that way too. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> but, uh, uh, that line resonated with me. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, she's like, this was a really interesting exchange. She, um, she says, he just makes me feel something like the sex is great, but it's more than that. And Ty says, he makes you feel it. And she says, I remember that. And Sean is like, Simone doesn't make you feel it anymore. And um, and Ty says, no, but you know what? It's okay. What we have is different, stable, it's safe. And, uh, you know, it, whatever that really means, it wasn't going to be any good for me. It's like if someone made me feel it, it wasn't going to be good for anyone, you know? And Shauna says, yeah, I think I do. I, I think Van made made Ty feel it, you know, yeah. and and maybe she just was never able to, you know, capture that, or maybe her and Simone had it at the beginning, but it faded away. But you know, I I think to an extent that you know, Van was like her first kind of love, and you know, maybe it's hard to get back to that place. I don't know. I want to see Van and Ty somehow mm-hmm. like rekindle in the future and 
you know, Me I want to see too. Ty have an affair with Van. I, I don't, I'm not a proponent of affairs, but yeah. if we had to see one, I would love to see one between Ty and Van, but you know, it could be conflict of interest depending on Van's involvement with the cult. So many different scenarios. Yeah. And, you know, and I, I love, like, I love Simone and, you know, she's, she's kind of a little girl crush for me, but um, cause she's just so cute and stylish and cool. But And such a nice mom. She's such a good mom. I love that about her. She's a very stable partner and, you know, not everybody like, you know, is in love with the stability, but they like it, you know? So yeah. Know. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe Simone will, you know, she's, she's not been that happy lately, but she does, she does love Thaisa. So I hope they can, they can work things out. But in the meantime, you know, yeah, Ty, Ty and Van hooking up in the present wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't bother me. Would not yeah. bother me at all. <laughs> oh my God. Not at all. Sorry, Simone. I love you. But <laughs> it's love you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but uh, like, you know, give her an affair too to make it to put them on equal playing field. Totally. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> She's entitled as well. Yes. Um, but uh, so then Shauna um, ends up surprising Adam at his place with coffee. And, you know, clearly she came to return the uh, the money clip. Mm-hmm. And she starts grilling him about Pratt. And um, he admits that he never went there. And, um, you know, she like, uh, I mean, she had asked him a bunch of questions and, and like, you know, what it, like, who was his favorite professor and, and, you know, so he, he figured out right away that she was onto him and, um, he's like, sorry, I, I was just trying to impress you. And, yes. um, so she asks, starts asking him other questions, like, where did you grow up? Um, he grew up in, in the suburbs of Houston. And um, he mentioned the high school that he went to, and I actually looked it up, and it was it is a high school in the, uh, ah. in the Houston area. Oh, that's uh, funny. But uh, she asks if he has any siblings, and he says an older brother, and she says, where is he now? And he says, Ann Arbor, Michigan. He's a colorectal surgeon, and he has this book in his house that's just called Anus, <laughs> <laughs> which is a real book. And I'm pretty <laughs> sure I have had to actually... Uh, I, I'm pretty sure I've actually had to reference this particular book before um, from my my formal my former uh, life of medical exam editing. <laughs> yes, uh, Anus is uh, edited by Richard Cohen, uh, Alistair Windsor, and it's a surgical treatment and pathology by Springer Books. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I for some reason I had to um, I, I edited uh, medical exams. Oh, um, that's like so interesting. For, yeah, for um for physician candidates, and um so you know like the board exams, and um I for some reason I tended to get a lot of the question a lot of the questions that I got tended to uh, be related to recreational anal injuries. <laughs> oh, fascinating stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was great. Hence you referring to anus multiple times. Yes. <laughs> The, the book, the book Anus. Yes. Yes. Surgical Treatment and Pathology by Springer Books. Anus, yes. anus, anus. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so he, um, you know, he acknowledges that he's got a juvenile sense of humor like most of the audience probably does. And myself. I mean, yes. I flashed up the anus thing and said anus as many times as anus will come out of my mouth because <laughs> I too am a 10 year old. So, yeah. Me, and, me and, and, you know, I was in like, and, and it was like, you know, it wasn't a surprise to me because I, I, kind of figured I knew what he was talking about just from what knew I knew about the anus. Knew yeah. About the anus. But I still like, I still had to giggle. <laughs> yes. No, absolutely. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so he like, you know, he, he asks her to go away with him for the weekend. He's like, you can ask me whatever you want and um, I'll be an open book. And uh, she, um, she's like, how am I going to explain that one? And he's like, I don't really give a shit. <laughs> he just really <laughs> wants her to come with him. Which, like, I mean, he is over eager to have her there. And I, I mean, apparently, you know, this information um, must have made her feel better. But like, for me, I don't think I would be going away on a weekend with this guy that she can't find anywhere on the internet and that, you know, has this brother who's a surgeon in Ann Arbor. Like, first, I would need to actually go home and like really confirm those facts before, you know, agreeing to anything. But um, especially like he's he's telling her where he wants to take her as a cabin in the Poconos, like. 
Right? <laughs> right? Is that intentional, you know? Is that an intentional thing or is it just happenstance that that's the location, you know, he picks? So, Ugh. yeah, I was kind of surprised that she just didn't balk at that right away. <laughs> no, right? <thank> you. <laughs> I mean, why would you ever want to go back to like the mountains in general after that? Like, I feel like I none of these girls have ever like camped in their lives after, you know, being stranded out there, but I could be wrong. <laughs> yeah. 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 But uh, yeah, Oof. I don't know. Apparently she, you know, she doesn't think it's that crazy. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, hey, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully it works out. Mm. Um, and then we go back to the past. We see Laura Lee waking everybody up and uh, letting him know that she's planning on flying the plane out of there. Um, in light of the expedition ending as it did, I've decided I'm going to take the dead guy's plane and fly south. I'm going to find us help and I'm going to get us out of here. She feels very confident about it. Um, you know, she's been reading the flight manual over the last, you know, however long they've been there. And she said the tank's got a full tank of gas. She's watched her grandfather fly the plane. So she's feeling pretty confident about it. I mean, I personally don't know what my confidence level would be, you know, just regardless of even if I knew how to fly a plane, like firing up a plane that's been sitting there for who knows how long. I mean, it just doesn't seem very safe. But I mean, if it's their only option, you know, good for Laura Lee for stepping up, right? Um, yeah. You know, and God's watching her. So, you know. Yeah. And I mean, she did survive one plane crash already. So <laughs> that's right. What's another plane crash? No big yeah, deal. Exactly. Um, and then it's in this scene when Jackie actually outs Shauna's pregnancy and Misty <laughs> tries to feel Shauna's stomach and Shauna like slaps her hand away. I mean, <laughs> like, you know, just a total typical MFQ moment. That was pretty um, funny. And then, you know, she says, Laura Lee says, it's going to be winter soon. If I don't do this, we're going to fucking starve. So um, she is really intent on flying that plane out of there. Um, ben says, all right, well, I'm still the only adult here. So no, I'm not going to let you do it. Laura Lee says, what are you going to do to stop me, coach? And, you know, it's funny that Coach Ben makes the comment about being the only adult there, because even though he is the only adult, like he can't be more than what, like 20 mid 20s maybe i don't yeah. know i mean it's hard to say but it's not as if he's this like super you know life experienced veteran of all these different things he is the only adult but you know it's it's an adult that um you know if the older coach had survived i feel like it would be a totally different like father figure thing but he's just not at the point of being like a father figure he's an adult but he's not you know a father figure anyway um, yeah well I, I think um the actor i think is like I think he's about, I think he's in his early thirties, early thirties. Okay. Preserved. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah. So it, it, I mean, of course he's playing an older character and the girls are, the younger girls are playing way, they're playing way younger than they are. But, um, but yeah, I don't think like he's, he's obviously very young. I mean, he's not too much older than them. No, um, not, not too much older, but he is the oldest and he is yeah. like, you know, he's got seniority and you know, the leadership mm -hmm. and all that stuff. So anyway. Yeah. Um, and uh, so back in the present, Thaisa comes home um, and Simone is there with Sammy. And um, I really liked Simone in the scene because she just kind of like she kind of gives her a death glare and um, she's just not happy with her. I mean, you know, she disappeared last night. She like, like, where are you? Like, where's, yeah, my, I mean, where's my wife? She hasn't been home. And um they cut quickly to the bedroom um, and they're sitting in there and Thaisa is kind of opening up and telling her what's going on with her. And she thinks that she might be the one who let Biscuit out. And like Simone just kind of does 180, which I thought was super cool. Like she was just, you know, she was totally ready to, hi to hold Ty accountable. But as soon as like she realized that Ty's going through something really serious like she immediately became sympathetic and supportive and and she's like you know baby we'll get you whatever help you need and and i'm here for you and we'll get through this and um and taisa just tells her that she she's clearly grateful but taisa tells simone that she needs her and sammy to go stay with at her mom's um for a while because she's basically afraid she's gonna hurt one of them which is just like, what an awful feeling. 
Uh, I mean, can you imagine that? Like feeling like you're going to be a danger to your family. I mean, you can tell in that scene, she's feeling that so deeply and wants to do whatever she can, you know, to protect them from her, which is terrible. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Oh, and yeah. And you know what? She actually did mention in this scene that it's, it's after the crash that she started sleepwalking. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, and she, she, she chalks it up to a symptom of the trauma. Um, but, uh, she said once they were rescued, it just stopped, but it seems to have just come back and she's kind of blaming, blaming it on the stress of the campaign. So that's interesting that like it stopped after they got out of the woods. That is interesting. So, I mean, I guess there's not a lot of other sleepwalking incidents then aside from the tree, you know, night watch when she fell asleep, the initial one out there and then, you know, what's been happening now. So, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Not as much to see there. And, uh, and then we, we, um, we cut back to Shauna and she's like, she's in her bedroom and she's looking at the dress that Jeff got her. And, um, <clears throat> you know, she, you could tell she's kind of like just thinking about the reunion and thinking about Adam and it looks, she goes to her closet and it looks like she's getting ready to get some stuff together to maybe take Adam up on his offer. Um, and then she finds glitter on the floor. Oh, and you've got to assume she's instantly thinking, well, Adam was hiding in my closet recently yeah, she, and hmm, this is maybe starting to add up a little bit. Right. So mm -hmm. in fact, it shows a um, it shows a, a, a quick flashback to um, of uh, of the scene right after they chased him down. And Thaisa said, look for an asshole covered in glitter. And um, yeah, yeah. and then she opens up her safe and her journals are gone. Oof. And that must have hit her like so hard. I mean, the journals are everything. That's that's her story, you know. So mm -hmm. she's she's freaking out at this point. Yeah, she looks like she got punched in the stomach. Yes. Um, and, you know, um, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, um, I think we also, we skipped a scene in the present did before we? that. Yes. Um, when Natalie goes to her we and did, Andy you're right. to look for her sponsor. And this is important. So, you know, we we want to cover that one too. Oh my God. We did. We just totally, I'm so sorry about that. That's my fault. I, yeah, totally breached past that. No big, so, no big, no big. Sorry we'll touch for the upon confusion, it now. everyone. Um, but before all that happens, before Thais and Simone, um, we actually had Natalie dressed up looking all chic and, uh, she was going to a narcotics anonymous meeting, um, and she did not go there to try to, uh, you know, because she fell off the wagon, she went there looking for her old sponsor. Um, and she finds her and the woman's reaction is just like, oh fuck, Jesus Christ, not you. Mm -hmm. Not <laughs> happy to goes, see her. And Natalie responds with, come on, I promise I won't assault you again. <laughs> oh, my God. And I have to say, I did not look this up because I kept meaning to and I kept forgetting. I swear this woman that plays Suze, her sponsor, was on Walking Dead. Um, oh, interesting. She, I, I want to say she was one of the women in Alexandria um, that got uh, that got hacked up by the by the wolves um and uh, her character's name if if it's the one i'm thinking of her character's name was miss mrs newdemeyer um but uh i i don't remember like i'm pretty sure she was in the walking dead if it wasn't mrs newdemeyer it was somebody else but i swear that's the same actress we'll i have, have to I mean, cross reference yeah i'll have to look that up later um but uh so they uh she Goes to she goes out for coffee with her and she Sue's just very unhappy to be there. Um, but she starts telling her about Travis, like Sue's knew about Travis. Um, but this is interesting because you know, Natalie all along has been saying she knew she knows that Travis didn't kill himself, but she never really elaborated on that. And she finally does here. And um she says uh she knows Travis didn't kill himself because he made her a promise. Um, she says that when she was on the, she said, when I was on the brink, he made me swear that I would never do that. And then he promised me the same. And even though my words don't mean much, I know I'm a liar. 
he always kept his word always so that adds a whole like a whole layer a whole huge layer of significance to her you know her belief that he was murdered which i i don't think anybody doubts at this point um but uh you know now you kind of understand better why she's like so adamant that he didn't kill himself and she's willing to do anything to get the information. I mean, she's basically, you know, threatening to blackmail her and tell the bank about how she used to sell customers' personal information to identity thieves. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and she's she's totally willing. Yeah, she's she's totally willing to uh, to sell out Sue's if she doesn't do it. So what was interesting to me is how, you know, Sue says that she wouldn't be able to get any of that information because it's like personal information and you're not family. And so then I was thinking, ooh, like, you know, what if, you know, what if Javi is still alive and he is his family and, you know, was able to close the account? Is he tied into this somehow, you know, or was it, you know, some overbearing cult, you know, that was able to infiltrate the bank information? But when she said that thing about, you know, family accessing personal information, I was like, hmm, that could maybe be a piece to the puzzle. Maybe Javi is still alive. Uh, we don't know. If he is, though, that's really odd that he would be that quick. Like, to, right? Like, and that would mean he's tied into the murder somehow, yeah. too, which, I, I mean, doesn't seem likely, but you never know. Like, she made the comment about family, so, like, my gears started turning. Yeah. Yeah. If Javi, if Javi was alive and he's the one that closed the account, he definitely had something to do with his death. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Sure. And let's hope that that's not the case, obviously. Yeah. But, I mean, who knows what happens, you know, out there in the woods. Javi, you know, is... Um, well, we can talk about that in spoilers, but yeah. anyway. Um, and then after that, you know, we go into the Simone and Ty scene when Simone's, you know, feeling, um, you know, like she wants to support Ty once Ty finally decides to be honest with her. And then um, we go back to another past timeline and the group is removing the overgrown grass and vegetation from around the plane, uh, mm -hmm. getting ready for Laura Lee to take it out. And that's when, um, you know, Shauna confronts Jackie about outing her. And, um, you know, there's a little little tension between those two. Um, and, you know, Jackie says something like, now's not the time to be keeping secrets. And, of course, you know, we know that Jackie has looked at Shauna's journals and now realizes that Shauna is keeping the ultimate secret, you know, of carrying the baby of her best friend's boyfriend. So, yeah. You know, it's interesting, though, that Jackie did not out her as far as um... – as far as her sleeping with Jeff. At this right. Point. Right. Cause she easily could have done that and turned literally everybody against her. So, you know, that little shred of compassion maybe, you know, speaks to the level of respect or friendship that they do have, even though Shauna has totally crossed the line and betrayed their trust on so many levels. Yeah. You could tell though. I mean, she like Jackie had a lot of, a lot of venom in, in her words when she was, saying the important thing is to get you and, and the baby out of here in safety. She like, she, she just wanted her out of her face. <laughs> right. Oh my God. Absolutely. And you, I mean, you've got to be thinking inside, like, does Jackie, you know, secretly hope that Shauna doesn't get out of there and the baby doesn't survive? I mean, hopefully not. I don't know. It's hard to say. Like Jackie can be such a bitch. It's, it's hard yeah. to say, but you know what? I mean, the fact that she knows about Shauna and Jeff, like, kind of entitles her to feel however she wants because I know I'd be fucking pissed. Oh, hell yeah. I yeah, mean, absolutely. like, obviously. Um, and then, you know, we move into our final timeline. We go back to the past, 1996. Uh, Laura Lee is about to leave and is hugging everybody goodbye um, for her big flight. Um, you know, Ben begs her one last time, please don't leave. And Laura Lee, you know, says, you know, it's it's her purpose. Um, and, you know, they're all... Um, looking at her she gets in the plane gets it started and you know has this like air of excitement like oh okay it's starting up this might work you know she starts heading towards the lake and she's like she's feeling it right she's like oh my god i'm actually doing this and you know takes up the plane actually gets into the air which i didn't even see happening so um you know she actually had a funny line as she was going to take off she says we need to get to 55 before we take off kind of like back to the future remember and you know back to the future was 80s uh so it's not my 90s moment of the show but her referencing back to the future was my nostalgic mom moment of the show i loved yeah. back to the future marty mcfly forever yes um anyway so the plane takes off 
um, you know, they're flashing between everybody on the ground watching her take off and her being in the cockpit. She's got her teddy bear Leonard sitting on the seat. And, um, you know, there's uh, some smoke. We see uh, Leonard actually catching on fire, the cockpit filling up with smoke. Uh, Jackie notices the smoke first on the ground and says, oh, hey, you know, is that smoke? And then pretty much right after Jackie says that, <laughs> the plane explodes over the lake. And, you know, it's very clear that Leonard and Laura Lee and the plane are all gone. Yeah. And so it seems is their, you know, latest hope of rescue and survival. So it ends on um, kind of a sad note. And R.I.P. Laura Lee and Leonard. Yeah. Um, gosh, we have some cute little teddy bears in our merch shop. Um, I feel like, you know, as an ode to Leonard, I need to get one of those bears. And, yeah. um, you know. Uh, Leonard. <laughs> yes, Leonard. And uh, call it Leonard and, you know, look at it and remember Laura Lee and her bravery. Aww. Yeah. Yeah. I Like, I was really sad. It's, you know, I thought, I thought Laura Lee, you know, we, she wasn't, um, she wasn't one of the biggest characters, but you know, she was still a main character. Um, and the one thing I really liked about her is she was like, I, shows tend to, to really pigeonhole like the uber Christian characters um, and tend to just like stereotype the hell out of them. And I really liked that she had a lot more depth. You know, I like that, too, because I, you know, am not personally a religious person. I have nothing yeah, against people who are, you know, I mean, to each their own, whatever your beliefs are. But um, but you're absolutely right. There is there does tend to be that stereotyping. And, um, you know, it was nice to see her backstory a little bit, too, and having that moment of being saved, which I feel like, you know, does add to her depth, but also just, you know, her her bravery and blind faith, you know, mm -hmm. um, she uses the F word in this episode, which I feel like is very un Laura Lee like. Um, yeah. And, you know, she was a, she was a good character. She was the voice of, you know, kind of reason and, um, you know, keeping keeping everybody believing, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. She like, you know, she kind of she kind of kept the hope up and and she was the only one that really, I mean, I don't know if any of the other characters are, are religious at all, but, um, you know, she obviously was very religious. And so she actually, like, she had a reason to believe that there was still hope. Um, whereas, like, you know, somebody like myself, who's a little more nihilistic, <laughs> I'd be like, okay, well, this is the situation. I'm going to. Like, fuck this, we're going to die. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you yeah. know. So. Yeah. So, I mean, when she died, it was just kind of like all the optimism and, and hope, any of it that they still had left just just died and fell in the lake. Oh, my God. <laughs> but, you know, as sad as this ending was, I think we have something to look forward to because next week we're going to cover uh, Doom Coming, yeah. episode nine, which is actually one of my favorite episodes. Such um, a great episode. Such a good episode. And it's, you know, it starts out, you know, really upbeat and a little bit more positive. It may not end that way, but, um, you know. Shit gets crazy. Shit gets really crazy. Like, yes. um, and, you know, we are going to dress up next week for Doom yeah. Coming in our best, um, you know, woodland headwear, whatever <laughs> attire. Um, I have acquired from my local buy nothing group, this like wood crown, a, a family found out in the woods when they were camping. And I'm going to adorn it with some additional nature -y type of things. And excellent. I can't wait to dress up for doom coming. Yeah, me either. I I'm excited. I'm super excited. And you know what, like for fans out there listening, if you want to post a photo or send us a photo of yourself in your best doom coming outfit, please do so. Either send it to us or, you know, tag us at the Antler Queens on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Um, we'd love to see your costumes. You know, maybe we'll feature it here or maybe, you know, we'll bring somebody on for the party, right? Because Doom Coming is actually meant to be, you know, like their their homecoming party. And, and we've actually also got some really great Doom Coming 96 gear in our store. Um, mm -hmm. All of our designs are available at antlerqueenspodcast.com. Uh, the Doom Coming one is probably one of my faves. I actually just ordered the Doom Coming fanny pack, uh, oh, which nice. I am so excited about. I thought that was really on point. We've got some really fun other designs also. We've got some citizen detective stuff, some 
there's no book club stuff. And one of my other favorites is the Peace, Love, and Yellow Jackets. Um, so we've got all kinds of stuff. Go check it out, antlerqueenspodcast.com. And huge and thanks I am to today Kelly. Actually, wearing the, uh, the Antler Queen uh, tank top. Um, I've got a shirt on over it, but yeah, this was uh, this was one of my favorite designs. So I had to I had to order that one. I love that one. And I'm actually I'm not wearing my shirt, but I do have my Citizen Detectives mug, um, you know, and then actually we have the new um, MFQ stuff in there, too, which I absolutely love. Let me see. Oh, here I do have a photo of that MFQ. MFQ, MFQ. That's going to be my next order. And, Me you know, too. again, thank you for designing, you know, the majority of these yeah. awesome designs. You're so talented. And, oh, you know, thank you. And thank you for that. So for anyone who'd like <laughs> to shop and support our podcast, antlerqueenspodcast.com. Yes. Um, yes. So please do that. Um, okay. So we're going to enter our spoiler segment. And spoilers by nature are, you know, we're going to talk about some things that are, happening in future episodes so if you have not finished the end of the season or you know do not want any actionable intelligence on you know speculation conspiracies things that have already happened leave now i am going to give you a five count to get out of the podcast and not be in our spoiler segment if you do not want to be five four three two one we have now entered the spoiler zone Yes. And um, I don't know, did you have anyone in particular that you wanted to um, that you wanted to address this week? No, I think for me, it was just like the glitter scene because, you know, yeah. they're still kind of leading us to believe that it's Adam, given that Adam was just in her closet. Mm -hmm. Of course, we know the actual blackmailer is Jeff. Right. So once we learn that, of course, it makes so much more sense knowing that the glitter is in the closet because it came off of Jeff who lives in the house, not mm -hmm. Adam, the boyfriend who was hiding in the closet, you know? So, um, you know, I just, uh, it's interesting. Cause I, you know, the first time I watched, I think I was, you know, the prior episode, I started to suspect Jeff just because of the timing of him being out of the house that night and everything. So this is when I really started to think like, you know, they want us to think it's Adam, but mm -hmm. you know, maybe, maybe it's not Adam. Um, so, well, you know, I mentioned that I mentioned earlier that I had something for the, the spoiler section. Um, and then I realized it's actually really not, it's not a spoiler. I don't know why, I, why my brain went to it being a spoiler. Um, but it's, it's not at this point. And it's about, um, it's about Ben. Um, so I'm just going to talk about it anyway, even though this is the spoiler cool. section. Talk um, away. But I had some thoughts on, uh, you know, they, they showed Ben and Natalie kind of like, well, I guess it is kind of a spoiler because we see them kind of bonding later in the Doom Coming episode. Um, and, but this is like the first time that they, like, that we kind of saw the two of them bonding. And, um, and you know, and he, he told her he was gay, which is, well, I mean, she called him out on it, but um, right. he obviously felt comfortable enough admitting it to her and being open with her. And I, I have this theory that the reason that there is so much animosity um, between, like, on Natalie's part toward Misty, I think Misty killed Ben. <gasps> Ooh. And that's my theory as to why. Because, you know, we keep saying, like, why did Natalie have all of this, like, extreme animosity? Like, she hunted her down with a shotgun. <laughs> And yeah. Oh my God. I mean, there has to be a reason why. And that is, that is a good reason. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And she like, she initially, didn't she initially like jump to the, um, like she assumed Misty was behind everything, was behind the black, the blackmail and, or, and everything, or the postcards at least. Right. 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 And um, she just, you know, maybe she found out, maybe it's because they find out later that Misty like, destroyed the the flight reporter but i always felt like it was something more than that and it just seemed very personal and i, I just i have this theory that we're going to continue to see natalie and, and ben get closer become closer friends and mm -hmm. misty's gonna get jealous and kill him or something <laughs> okay i like where your head's at i like where your head's at um yeah 
And, you yeah. know, another kind of like, I mean, it's a, not as much of a spoiler, I guess, but they're really setting the table in this episode with Ty and her sleepwalking because we do actually find out what happened to Biscuit, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, Biscuit is found um, dead with his head. His head was cut off, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, yeah, we find Biscuit dead. So we're kind of getting like the setup and the backstory to that, which is, you know, I'm, I'm a, we're both big dog people, right? So that was yeah. like, that was really sad. Poor Biscuit. Oh my god. I just, I have a lot of questions about that because, like, the easy thing is to to say it was like, you know, Ty did all that during a disassociative state, and right. I think it's very possible that she could have beheaded Biscuit during a. a yeah. Like while she was dissociating, but that whole altar and everything just seems really, like, seems really complicated for something like that would be done while she was in that state. You know what I mean? Right. Like the level of actually following through with that and like the logistics of it. I mean, that's not an easy thing to do. I mean, I've never beheaded a dog, but you know, I can't imagine. <laughs> I do it all the time. Imagine it's easy. I mean, you know, we know that, you know, like Sean is experienced with a knife. We know that Misty is experienced with an ax. We know mm -hmm. that there's some cult out there who is maybe experienced in murder amongst other things. So, I mean, there's definitely possibilities that it's not Ty. Um, maybe this is another red herring, you know, like she's talking about biscuits, setting it up. Maybe it's too easy. You know, maybe they're just trying to fool us again. These pesky writers. Oh, my goodness. They're so good. It was Mari. I'm telling you, it was <laughs> Mari, is a bloodthirsty hench woman for for uh, for adult Lottie. <laughs> I mean, we can't put anything past any of these girls. They've been through so much. Um, yes. You know, it's it's interesting to consider how their lives would have been different had they not all experienced this common trauma and, you know, how each one of their lives is so different from one another, yet they all wear this trauma in some way. And, you know, we've still yet to determine, you know, the reality of this cult, which, you know, I mean, obviously a lot of these people probably would not have ended up in a cult had they not been in warring clans after a plane crash in the wilderness. So, yeah. So, so many things. Oof. Yeah. This, uh, yeah, this was just a, this was a really heavy episode that I think like half of the questions that I have um, about the show, like I swear half of them came from this episode alone. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there were a lot of back and forths and timelines. There was, you know, some, speculation on different things. We had some really good quotes in this episode also, which I, I did not show during the episode. Um, you know, Adam, and he has this book in his house that's just called Anus. Just wanted to say Anus one more time. So yes. there, there we are. Um, let's see. I showed Callie's quote graphic earlier. Um, we had one from Nat. Um, she says, are you seriously going to ruin this over something so fucking stupid, you know, in relation to her and Travis's uh, decline? And um, when Nat is talking to Coach Ben, she says, dumped by Misty Quigley? That's rough, man. Um, <laughs> you know, so that was that was kind of funny, too. So there were some good one-liners in here. Um, you know, just going back one more time to Vans with the fire at the beginning. Like, I can't even get over it. Like, this I girl know. will not die. Her one-liners are so good, even on the total brink of death. I fucking love you, Van. I love I, you. I know. She's she's just she's she's just a fucking rock star. But I mean, okay, so first, you know, she she was pinned between two seats on the plane and it exploded and she got out. Um she survived getting attacked but and have half of her face torn off by a wolf. She survived getting set on fire, which, you know, and I watched it back this time and I thought, okay, well, it doesn't look like it, too much of the fire got to her. Her legs were fully on fire. There were flames like in, like all over, all over her. Like her yes. legs were fully on fire, fully fired up. And even if like, even if that alone normally wouldn't kill a person after what she's been through, like, I mean, it should have killed her. It should have killed her. And and then she survives being having her face stitched up, like I she can't makes even. it all the way back to all the way back to camp, like incredible. 
She is literally the Energizer Bunny. Like yes. literally, we need to like make a little cartoon illustration with her face on the Energizer Bunny, I feel like. I mean, she's, she just um, keeps on ticking. She, I think she's the secret vampire. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree. Um, and, you know, I just want to take a moment too. We got a couple of comments today during the live stream from um, my friend Kelly Parker, who's up in Canada. She agrees with us that Julia Stiles would be perfect. So thank you for that, Kelly. Um, and also our friend Kristen McIsaac on there dropped a yellow heart in the comments. Thank you for that, Kristen. And thank you both for tuning in. Um, again, we're going to cover doom coming next week and we want you to bring your best doom coming look, whether that's sending us a picture, posting it on social media and tagging us, or, you know, if you want to pop on the panel and, you know, maybe, maybe have a little fun with us for a few minutes as we recap the episode, we're open to all of it. Um, but it's going to be fun. Um, I cannot wait to wear my costume next week. I love costumes, especially (laughs) headwear. Headwear is like my favorite. We need like a headband sponsor. Yes, we do. Don't we? (laughs) Yes. Have you watched the show, the Duchess on Netflix before with, I think it's Catherine Ryan. She's a comedian. She's British. She wears these headbands and it's from this company in Europe and they are like the nicest headbands I've ever seen. Victoria Percival, I think we need to reach out and get some headwear sponsorship. I feel like. Totally. Yes. Yes. <laughs> we, are anyway. the crew, aren't we? we digress. But anyway, <laughs> um, we will be back for Doom coming next week, uh, Thursday at 1230 p.m. Pacific, 230 p.m. Central, 330 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, we hope you'll join us. Yes. Thank you for joining us today. And thanks for putting if you're watching us. Thanks for putting up with my my allergy written blood blood blotched face oh my goodness <laughs> you were not bad at all at all um i lost my train of thought at one point you know during the episode so apologies for that but you know what nobody's perfect we're here having fun and thank you for joining us as we have it yes and uh hey kelly what's up melanie buzz off buzz off and with that antler queens out <laughs>